Good morning, guys. Another beautiful morning in June. Birds are chirping. I love the birds chirping in the background of these videos. Today I want to deal with a question that might seem apparent to many people. What is the point of reading what uh, a novel? Why would a serious person read a novel? Well, what's a serious person? A serious person is someone who is interested in the question, what is the point of life? What should I do as a human being? How should I live as a human being? What's the significance of life? You know, people who ask questions like that, in my opinion, they qualify as serious people. People who want to live their life in relation to meaning. So f people for whom the quest these questions are relevant. Uh, it's not, I don't, I don't believe in 46 years of life, I don't believe everybody is this way. Um, I think sometimes people, you know, get to points in their life where they have to stop and sort of think about what they're doing. Um, you know, if when they're sick or they have an injury or a death in the family, I think people pause a little bit. Almost everybody pauses and take stock. Uh, but but even that, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and judge anybody. I've only lived my own life, experienced my own life. Everything else is just sort of supposition. But I'm pretty sure you could divide the world through through that category. Are they a serious person or not a serious person? And uh, <laughs> for the serious people, it's really difficult to bear with the non-serious people. And the non-serious people have little time for the serious people. They consider them boring or depressive or whatever. It's, it's a good question anyway, like what is the point of reading fiction? Now, I'd like to further specify, I don't read fiction. I read great fiction. Um, I read the classics. Now, what qualifies something old as something worthwhile reading? Well, no, it's not because it's old. It's because it's a classic that puts it onto the table of books that uh, one might consider uh, as having value in it. You have to judge for yourself. You have to actually read the book, of course, to decide whether it has value or not. There are old books that I didn't didn't like. Uh, there are celebrated works that I didn't like. That might be about me or it might be about the book. Um, but one of the greatest things, the reason why, here's a good, uh, here's a good analogy. The difference between a used bookstore and a regular bookstore in Canada, it's usually chapters or indigo. The difference between a used bookstore and a regular bookstore is that time has called the quality of the books, of many of the books you see in a used bookstore. So it's kind of like there was a survival of the fittest going on there in the in the used bookstore because yes i understand there's lots of lots of the romances and popular popular fiction makes it to the used bookstore but as time goes on the older the books the higher the quality really in, in that sense i mean think of all the books from rome and greece that we don't have anymore because frankly nobody considered them worthwhile saving so such is the thing with with our our civilization you know thousands of books are written a year now but perhaps only a handful will make it to the used bookstore of the future you know in a hundred years from now how many books from the turn of the millennium will will arrive <laughs> will still be present you know i can think of uh, certain ones of course um you know, most of the celebrated ones, the most famous ones, but even will, will, uh, probably the Harry Potter ones will be still be there in a hundred years. I've never read them, but, uh, they certainly will have a historical value anyway. But when I think of serious books, I think of things like works of philosophy. Now, not, I don't mean sort of just, you know, scholastic treatises on epistemology, um, which are, which are wonderful, which are very fine. I mean, you know, works like, uh, Hume or Locke on, you know, understanding, 
human, how we comprehend things, you know, the critique of pure reason by Kant. Um, I'm thinking of the serious um, works of, of ethics. You know, I'm thinking of, you know, one of the greatest books ever written was Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, the works of Plato. And then I'm thinking of things like Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard. When I think of serious works, these works jump to the forefront and the and you know and people like Thoreau and, and all these people works of uh, this eminent practical practical kind you know or the works of Confucius stuff like that uh, the works of Saint Augustine so when I think of serious books I mean I would I would I always wanted to be the author of one of these serious books you know whether we're, we're talking about like Schopenhauer's studies and pessimism or Kierkegaard's works these are these are works of the highest caliber you know these are the works that that deserve to be treated with the most the most diligent study okay let's cross the threshold here back to fiction what is the point of reading fiction my first and strongest love in fiction was uh, War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Tolstoy in his autobiographical writings makes his connection to serious the serious works he, he references Schopenhauer uh, all the time and the transition from say for instance Schopenhauer's serious work over to Tolstoy's fiction is a very apparent one if you know anything about Tolstoy's life story the difference between a work like War and Peace or Anna Karenina between that say for instance and say for instance you know popular young adult fiction today Let, let's look back even at uh, I mean Harry Potter or something like that I'm thinking of the young adult works that my daughter one of my daughters reads now I'm not saying that they can't be serious works of literature and serious serious elements can, can crop up in otherwise non-serious works of fiction but in general fiction is like painting it is the attempt to represent life a work of of uh, visual art say for instance a work of vermeer is great to the extent that it takes something from life and represents it in some sort of convincing uh, attempt at beauty um, so in this sense war and peace or don quixote are great to the extent that they represent something beautiful now beauty isn't just a is, isn't this in this sense just a positive thing uh, suffering itself is beautiful as an expression of human experience as an expression of mankind's struggle to find meaning in life there's something beautiful in that there's something um, admirable there's something worthwhile in that the contemplation of suffering you know I can think of the book of Job the last days of Socrates you know the the works like his Apologia and Critias and so on so there's something something beautiful in the struggle you know even Augustine's Augustine's confessions or Tolstoy's confessions um, the suffering of of Dante as he's as he tries to find a relationship with beauty and love in La Vita Nuova or even the Divine Comedy so there's suffering suffering stands in relation to beauty as well I suppose Thomas Aquinas would call appetite to satisfaction I suppose suffering is is the questing for beauty the great works of literature take seriously the human condition the point of it its philosophical value consists in its ability to draw us along and to enter into these the philosophical question of what is life does it have significance what is goodness what is the good life what is the worthwhile life what is the meaning of my life what is happiness can one be happy can I be happy a good work of literature can do that I mentioned Don Quixote I would say that it's it well it's again it's one of my absolute favorite 
books and it has continued to grow on me. Initially, I didn't, I didn't like it that much. It was so tedious, but rereading it, I began to enjoy it more and more. Even as a comedy, primarily a comedy, it is every bit as much a Vermeer or a Rembrandt as War and Peace is. How can that be? Well, I don't have a good definition of comedy, or, but comedy and tragedy, I think, stand together very closely. And it's funny that, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's, who's noticed that laughing and crying are pretty close, closely linked. I mean, I'm not the only one, I'm sure, who's laughed so hard that he's cried. Physiologically, the experience of the two is is really close, and I think maybe it's the endorphin release or whatever that that the two things, the two activities, release. Maybe that's their link, but I don't think it's their only link. Now I'm not going to sit here and come up with a good philosophical de definition of comedy or laughter or tears and tragedy and sadness. I'm not capable of that <laughs> in any any simple way and I know that many people have written on it and I'm sure there's lots of worthwhile works out there on the subject so in this presentation of life here it is here's life look at it a good work a good writer will draw one into that to take a closer look at what one didn't see before now what does one doesn't have to read you could compare it to being a good observer of people Books are the, are the favorite venue of introverts, not so much for extroverts, but extroverts can learn and engage these questions as well. And I think they often do through conversations, through social interaction, like <laughs> introverts do with literature. Now, both people should do both, right? Both kinds of people should do both activities. Scientists don't limit themselves to only one kind of data. You can, you can gain more through different, through different types of data and, and compare them. Even the question of Don Quixote, uh, the examination of comedy, can bring out so many things that are important about these fundamental, important questions. That is the greatness of Don Quixote. The reason why it's so loved, it's not just comedy, but it's comedy that draws us into these fundamental questions of human life. Uh, I think, you know, Gogol did that well with Dead Souls. And you know what? I don't understand Shakespeare's comedies, so I can't talk about that. Comedy is more time-specific. I think it's a more limit limited... Uh, it's, it's a language that doesn't transcend time as easily as tragedy does. I find this is one of my thoughts. I could be wrong. Um, I'd love to be corrected or, or whatever. I don't understand Shakespeare's comedies. I don't understand what makes them funny, you know, and I do have a <laughs> more, more historical knowledge than, than your average Joe, but I, I, so far I haven't enjoyed Shakespeare's comedies. But his tragedies do speak uh, eloquently across time. And why is that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think comedy is more uh, time-specific than tragedy. So Job in the Bible... Ecclesiastes, the tragedies of Shakespeare or whomever, these, these, these translate into other languages rather easily, whereas comedy is, is, is more limited in that regard. But it's not less important. Comedy is not less important. And I think some of the people that I respect most and, in, and have influenced me the most and continue to, on, for instance, on YouTube, are comedians. Because comedian comedy looks at something old in a new way and finds something absurd about, about it, about life. Something like Dead Souls or Don Quixote can stand the test of time. But I don't know. I don't know. It's worth talking about why, you know, how, how can a comedy be successful over time and how can one not or why, when, what happens when one doesn't. It might be just its its cultural references are, are, are too limited, too narrow, too specific. The, the hesitancy of people towards fiction, I think, resembles a great deal or parallels 
much of the criticism that is now being leveled against a liberal arts education. Liberal arts, well, has and, and, and is growingly being more criticized all the time. It's, it's what's the point? I think the, the criticism follows from the fact that, I would argue, people aren't being educated in the liberal arts. In your com contemporary university, you're not being taught to think critically. You're not being taught to engage in a study of the human condition. You're being taught the right views to have, right? You're being indoctrinated in a narrow ideology, Marxism. So, you know, I, I can talk more about that in, a, in another video. But the criticism being leveled against the university today is not the same thing as the criticism being leveled against the liberal arts. Those are two different things. The universities are not doing the liberal arts. And I can agree that in its current state, the liberal arts as taught by the university is not good, is not worthwhile, it's not worth the money and the time. Now, there's probably universities out there that do present the liberal arts in a worthwhile way, in a, in a way that's worth your $100,000. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are, you know, despite the universal war that the Marxists are waging against liberal education. Insofar as the liberal arts engage in a very special way, and I think often far more directly than the hard sciences, chemistry, physics, uh, biology, and I'll just throw in math as well, I think that the liberal arts can engage the serious enterprise of what it is to be a human being more directly and more powerfully than the hard sciences. So the questions of sometimes novels can, be, can seem to be about trivial things like <laughs> love, romance, and all that silliness. But if you look at the great novels, and I'm going to throw my girl Jane Austen here into the mix. Jane Austen, on the surface, seems to be writing about silly things. You know, 18-year-old girls trying to find Mr. Perfect. But the way she does it isn't silly. And one of the greatest works of the, of the 19th century by George Eliot, uh, Middlemarch, I, I can't begin to tell you how impressive it is as a serious work of literature. And on the surface, it just seems to deal with the regular questions of marriage and love and all that stuff. Anyway, these are just some initial thoughts. And I'll put up some good quotes in this video and to try to substantiate some of the things I'm talking about. But anyway, I really appreciate you guys listening. And uh, please support me, PayPal, uh, Patreon, all that stuff. Have a great day, guys.